Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with New York jazz vocalist Jackie Messina. She opened up about her new 2022 CD. It's a reissue called Necessary Arrangements. It's a thoughtfully considered collection of standards that are full of power. She was lured from the success as a writer by the interactive creativity of jazz. She studied at the Brooklyn Conservatory of Music and decided to go after her dreams, and we're all happy she did. Enjoy her story. Hey, thank you for taking a minute out for the show today. I appreciate it. Seems like a very interesting show. Some great interviews. Oh, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. We try to keep things interesting around here. You managed to do it. Because I've been checking some of the interviews out. Cool. I appreciate it. First thing that I want to get into is your new album, Necessary Arrangements. You know, we're living through this COVID time right now, and things have been kind of upside down for the last couple of years. What does this release mean to you to actually get back to having music out there and the possibility of performing this live and promoting it live? This is a, actually, it's a reissue, uh, because at the time uh, it, that I issued it, you know, I sort of hit the wall financially <laughs> um, in terms of my other work. So it was on the back burner, and... Uh, the pandemic, you know, like many other people, it sort of gave me time to examine what my priorities are. And, uh, you know, I realized I really want to get out my CD and have it heard. And I never promoted it at all. I just made it. I put maximum effort in, into into it artistically. And then it, it sort of sat there. So... This was a time when I said, you know, I really, I really want to put my music out there. And also, as things are opening up, it's the perfect time to promote it so that, you know, I can get more gigs because I'm, I'm more available now, uh, you know, having kind of cut back on my regular uh, teaching job. What are you ultimately hoping those that buy or download this re-release, what are you hoping they get from this? I, I hope that people hear it more people hear it, and that I get more live gigs, <laughs> more opportunities to perform this repertoire and some new repertoire also. Over this time, of, as you said, you know, there's projects that people got to finish. There's a lot of self-reflection over this last few years. What did you learn about yourself that maybe you didn't realize before this pandemic that's going to make you stronger as you get out and promote this album? Well, I realized how, how music is sort of a salvation for me. It's a spiritual renewal for me. With all the bad stuff that's happening, I sort of regard it as my magic cloak, that it somehow uh, the beauty of it protects me from, is, is a barrier to all the ugliness in the world. You know, that's, that about says it, you know. And so I want yeah. to spend more time in it, in that, in that world, in that beauty. How did everything begin for you? How did the jaws of jazz and music become something that took hold and made you make a career out of it? I explained that in, my, uh, in the notes to the CD that, um, you know, I had moved from uh, Princeton, New Jersey to Park Slope for a new job. I'm a learning disability specialist. So I, I, I moved to Park Slope, and it just so happened that the one night that I was free, I had, a, I had an incredibly intense, high-pressure job involving um, testing for learning disability. And I had one night off, and it was Monday night. And that night off was the night that, that there was a vocal, uh, jazz vocal workshop at the uh, Brooklyn Conservatory of Music, and I lived a block away from it. it just so happened. All these coincidences sort of synchronized. I went over there, and it was an incredibly high-level uh, person who who was managing this workshop, who was conducting, directing this workshop. And his name was Enos Payne, and he was a, a monster piano player. But we had a whole, but he had a whole trio there in the auditorium of the conservatory. So we got to sing, all the members of the workshop got to sing with the trio, which is very important, I mean, with a uh, rhythm section. So that was very important because you got to hear the bass solos. You got, you got to hear the drum solos. You got to, to work with the other musicians so that you could create something together. And so um, I explained 
that I, I was a writer for many years, and I had, I had sort of quit writing before I, I made the transition to, to uh, Park Slope. One of the reasons I quit writing was that um, it was very lonely and isolating. I mean, there were things about it that I enjoyed, obviously, if I wrote so, you know, so for so many years. But when I discovered jazz, I discovered a, a sort of a, a creative community. And that, you know, if, if I came in there with a song, you know, said, here, he said, let's try it this way. And the bass player would do something with it. And the drum, you know, the drums, we might change the rhythm with it. So this was, a, this was a communal creative project. It wasn't just me. That was very beautiful and very social. I immediately found something that was very nourishing to me. Having been creative by myself for so many years, I found it wonderful to create together. You know, what I thought, if I brought in, um, I had an idea for I Feel Pretty to sing it in four. So, uh, uh, you know, I brought it to Enos and he said, okay, let, let, let me think about that. He said, that's a great idea. Let, let's, do, let's do that. And then he created an arrangement for it that was based in four. So what came out was something we, we all, you know, contributed to. I had the initial idea, but we all contributed to it. And that was far more beautiful than anything that I could think of on, on my own. That's how I came to love jazz so much. What was the first live jazz show that you ever saw that really blew you away? I really can't pinpoint that. Well, one of the first lives uh, was to, to hear Sheila Jordan. That was quite a while ago in Manhattan when I moved. And she had done an, uh, an album, a poet. It was uh, music that was written to, to the lines of a poet or some poet. So that was sort of a natural affinity that I had to her. And I really, you know, I really enjoyed um, Sheila Jordan. That's what comes to mind, the first, you know, jazz show that I, that I saw when I came to, to Manhattan. Talk to me a little bit about what is it that you look forward to the most being a professional musician? What do you like the best about it? Uh, I like the creative process of listening to something and, and hearing it in my mind in a new way. I, I'm not interested in imitating Sarah Vaughan or I can't, <laughs> you know. I mean, I, I greatly admire these, you know, great singers. You know, I might practice a, a Mel Torme scat or something just to internalize a uh, scat language and so forth. But I, I'm looking to reimagine songs, which is why I tend to veer away from the big standards. I probably will never will never record I'll Remember April. That's n not to take away anything from from those people who can who can sing those songs spontaneously and and bring something new to them. But it's harder for me. So what I do is I I tend to uh, gravitate to songs that are not, you know, sung as much and I can hear something new and and bring something new to them. And that's why these this, this these particular songs are, were among those that um, you know I developed something about. So why do you love jazz? Well, I love jazz because of the communal creativity and the fact that the individual, you know, there's always a place for the individual voice, and that's what you know the rounds of solos are are, are all about. That we're all you know the musicians and the singers. And the singer, they're working communally, but there were also ha there's a place for the, their individual voice to be heard. So it's it's a very uh, it's a very lovely communal endeavor, and that it's always changing. I also love the tradition. You know, I love to hear people who are really steeped in the tradition and the language of scatting, for example. You know, even though people say, well, you just scat whatever way you want, eh, not really. Because when I hear somebody scatting who sounds really authentic, they've sort of developed, they've sort of internalized the vocabulary. There is a vocabulary for scatting. And I love the fact that there's always something new to learn. And that's part of any art. You know, it certainly is part of jazz. And I love the community of, in Manhattan, it's a very strong community where I, I can go to shows or I could go to jam sessions and I'll always see people that I know. 
and it's a very supportive community. You know, you might think that, oh, gee, it's, it's very um, competitive, but I, but I find that it's very supportive. We do go and hear each, go to support each other and be audience as well as, as performer. Everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, but ultimately you live your life. You have a perception of yourself. Who do you think you are? Yeah, that's the work in progress. That's for everyone, you know? The fact is I, I would never have predicted that I would leave writing for jazz. It just was a, it was sort of a fortuitous combination of events that put me there. So I think that when you're searching and you're open to something, like I was searching for, for a new kind of expression, and in my new environment, I was very open, and it happened. And I, I just think I was very fortunate to have met Enos and to be you know, a block, two blocks away from the conservatory, and this opportunity opened, and, uh, you know, it was really a really happy, happy coincidence. Who am I? I think I'm still, you know, somewhat of a writer. I'm very, very sensitive to lyrics because of ha having been a writer. I don't pick, uh, and, and another, so I'm very selective about songs. I don't want to to sing something that seems trite. I do attempt every now and then to write lyrics. If I do, they're, they're, I'm, I'm very, very self-critical about them because, you know, having been a writer, I, I, I know what cliche is. So I'm very selective. So a lot of the songs on this CD, I feel, are have really high-quality lyrics. I think, well, I can't think of anybody higher than Stephen Sondheim, you know, and the Wild is the Wind is extremely poetic, and Quiet Now is just lyrically gorgeous as well as melodically, you know, stunning. I think that that ballad is just amazing. I Believe in You is extremely witty. So I, I feel that uh, all of these um, show me extremely witty. I feel that I select songs that are you know, sort of reflect my taste in language as well as my taste in music. And, and that's, lots of, that's my persona is that I'm going to try to give you something new. I'm going to try to give you something that is of a high quality, tasteful. I, I'm going to try to give a new take on it so that it's fresh. And that's what I feel that the CD, you know, is all about. It's a tribute to my mentor, um, you know, who, who passed away very unexpectedly at the age of 49. Yeah, I kind of wanted to, gee, you know, we did all this work together. Let me get it out there so people can listen to it because I think it's really good. Jackie, thank you for taking a minute out to the show to talk about the album and your life and music. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview. We give you a bit of insight into the finest singers in New York, Brooklyn, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Jackie for her time, music, and stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. On easy street Neon Jazz